Are we on air? You're now listening to the legendary Royal Esquire. Royal Esquire. I live claimed in the Bronx as one of the best special mix DJs. DJ Jazzy J at the side of DJ Africa Bambada of the Zulu Nation has been heavily involved in introducing hip hop and rap culture to downtown Manhattan and the rest of the world. Before we get started, I want everybody to know my name is Russell Rush and I come to play the cold rock stuff. Royal Esquire. Royal Esquire. Jazzy, Jazzy, Jazzy. It's like a heart. <laughs> Cold rock, though. Three, two, one more. Three, attend the day. Come on, where's the guy from me? You know the vibes. It's off the house vibes. Check it out, y'all, and you don't stop. Take hey, little Jack Corner. Sat in his corner. Eating his curves away. The way away soon. Came and bought Who sat down beside him along with his man, Jazzy J. Hello world, I want to welcome you to Vinyl Esquire, the podcast that delivers culture, truth, music. Would you join me please in welcoming DJ Rick. Hello world, I want to welcome you to Vinyl Esquire, and my name is DJ Rip. And Vinyl Esquire is the DJ podcast that uplifts the DJ culture and honors our legends. So without further ado, I would like to introduce to Vinyl Esquire, the legendary DJ, the legendary turntablist from the Bronx. I would like to welcome the original DJ Jazzy J. Yes, yes, y'all. Just getting the thing in, man. Vinyl Esquire in the place to be with the Jazzy J, man. You know how it go out. Yo, Jay, how you doing, man? You good? Yeah, man, you know, one day at a time, one foot in front of the other, you know what I'm saying? Walking the walk, talking the talk. Absolutely. Well, I I, uh, I start every interview the same way. I want to go all the way back to your uh, your beginnings, and we can pull back all the layers on your vast history. So let's get right to it. So, Jay, tell me what or who made you want to be a DJ? Oh, well, basically, you know, growing up in the projects up in, in, in the Bronx, Bronx River Projects, more or less, I, I used to listen to, like, uh, a lot of, uh, like, the Jazz Mobile, and, you know, they used to come out with the music, the live bands and all of that. So, you know, I was kind of influenced from all of the soul and the funk, like the Gladys Knight and the Pip, the Temptations, by the Family Stones, the Rufus Thomases, and especially, uh, rest in peace, my man James Brown. And this was like kind of like the backdrop of my of my childhood. And as I, you know, started going into my teenage years, you know, early teens, I started hearing, you know, like DJs come out in the park, and that kind of like took the uh, uh, took me away from, you know, what I was doing. As uh, as far as like I grew up in in, in, a, in a church environment, so I used to play the drums in the church. So I was always kind of connected with music. And then when I seen these guys, you know, just the uh, energy that they had, uh, you know, was one guy named DJ Tommy. He used to have, he used to be a bass player. He used to come down in front of his building, 1425 or whatever the building was, in front of my mother's building. And he used to bring out his little two bass columns and his earth head and plug in two turntables and then, you know, play songs back and forth. And just to see how the crowd embraced him. It was like right then I knew it was something special about being a DJ. And, you know, because up until then, being a DJ was meaning like somebody on the radio, like a Frankie Cocker or a Hank Span, you know, somebody you couldn't physically see what they would do. Only thing you could basically just hear them, you know, speak smoothly on the radio and then introduce songs. And, you know, it wouldn't have that cohesive flow like these cats when they came outside, you know what I'm saying, and plugged into the somebody's outlet, a uh, stench of core dropped out the window, whatever the deal is. So I think those early days is, is kind of like what inspired me to want to do it. But, you know, being from the projects and being poor, I didn't know how it was going to come about, but, you know, as time went on, you know, I figured out a way to just make it do what it do and uh, realizing that, hey, that was my calling anyway. So 
it was meant to happen. So what what year would you say that you started DJing? Uh, well, you know, I I would say somewhere in the, in, in the mid '70s, '74, '75, '76, somewhere in that area. But you know, at that time, it, it, you know, all of that was all brand new. You know, everybody's all yeah. You know, I started. I you know, I I could say I started. But, you know, it was, like, really, really rough. I was cornball, you know what I'm saying, just trying to... <laughs> right, right. Just trying to, you know, trying different things, you know. And like I said, being that, you know, we were kind of economically challenged, you know, I used to just go around, somebody threw out, like, an old component set or old stereo console. I used to, to come down with my tools. Uh, my father was a mechanic, so I'd just snatch up some tools, go downstairs, pull the turntable out, take the back off, pull the, pull the speakers out, come back upstairs. And, you know, I'm also a carpenter, so I'd take some wood and put four pieces of wood together, throw screw the speakers in, you know, got me a little speaker here, the turntable there. None of them matched because, you know what I'm saying, what are the odds of some, somebody throwing out two uh, component sets with matching turntables or, or turntables that actually work. So, wow. you know, that's, that's how I kind of got my start in doing all of that. But uh, I would say like the mid-70s was a uh, starting point for me. Got you. How old would you say that you were? Oh, uh, started from like the age of 13, 14 years old. You know, that's when I got the bug and knew that that was something I wanted to do. Got you. So I understand that you were also a, a dancer in the beginning. Uh, you were a Zulu King dancer. Now, was that prior to you uh, learning and wanting well, to be a DJ? Or Let's get it straight. When I was dancing, there, there wasn't no Zulu King. Zulu Nation hadn't even started yet. Gotcha. You know, you know, Zulu Nation was the idea, of, you know, that, uh, that Africa Bambada came up with after the Black Spades that broke up and all of that. But, you know, I wouldn't even call it b-boying because this was before it was labeled b-boying. You know, you just went to the jam, and when you got to the jam, you went off. You know, it be the, the, the art form of what they know now is as breaking, b-boying, whatever you want to call it. You know, it started out as a kind of rivalry between gangs. So when gangs started getting tired of killing each other, you know, uh, uh, battling with the with the with the chains, the bats, you know, the knives, and so on and so forth, they would, uh, you know, at, at any time the two gangs would meet up at, at a neutral place, like a, a at a jam. You know what I'm saying? They put their best dancers uh, forth, and the dancer used to represent that gang. So whoever had, you know, the, they, whoever had the best dancer, you know, that would be like the rumble. So wow. to speak, back in the, but everybody would leave. Everybody would leave out. You know, there was a lot of animosity because it was all it was all a, a, a challenge. It was all you know, I'm saying uh, rivalry or whatever the deal is. But it was to me, it was it was the beginning of a different type of rivalry. So you know, I used to you know I used to do that, and uh, you know, then it got to the point where you know when when the gang started disbanding, you know, you had your different crews, you know, and different organizations that you know were came sprung up out of that. You know, what I'm saying the right. graffiti was there. Because of the fact that whenever one crew or one gang would come into another another's territory, they would leave their mark so as to let them know, yeah, we were in your area and there's our mark. So, you know, the dancing was like, like you know, letting you leave in your mark on the crews. Like, uh, listen, you know what? Even though we're not, we, we're not selling here, spilling no blood, we still got the upper hand on you. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, I tried a little bit of everything. I tried the... Uh, graffiti for a while you know that was actually my first introduction to the culture then okay. i tried to be b-boy for a while but i knew where once i once i uh discovered the music aspect of it i knew that's where i wanted to be got you so you uh you t you dibble dabbled in graffiti a little bit and you were a dancer so then you ended up becoming a dj or wanting <laughs> to be a dj correct Yes, sir. You know, are you still about 13 right now <laughs> around this time, correct? Oh, you know, times went faster in those days. You know what I'm saying? You couldn't wait for summer to get summer to come so that, you know, all of these things could take place. Because, you know, more or less during the winter, you know, my parents wasn't having it too much. You couldn't really go hang out and this and that. But in the summertime, it was a free for all. So basically, you know, as a, every summer progress, we definitely was waiting for those things to happen for the music the music to start jumping off in the streets of New York, you know. Was Jazzy J your first DJ name? Nah, not at all. Not at all. Not at all. It took me a while to actually think of the name Jazzy J because, you know, uh I I I actually was just like 
at a, at a crossroads because at that point in time, everybody wanted to be cool DJ this and every, you know, it was the era that everybody wanted to be cool and slick and suave and, and this and that. The reason why I chose the name Jazzy J is because, like I said, uh, I was into, uh, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a drummer. Right. So I, and the type of music that I used to listen to to uh, actually p- perfect my drumming skills, I used to listen to a lot of jazz drums. So I kind of like just took that 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 kind of like influence. I'm like, hmm, yeah, I love me some jazz. And I took the first letter of my name, J, and I said, oh, jazz, J, jazzy J, okay. And you know, I, I when and, and it was kind of weird because a lot of people at that time wasn't used to to somebody you know with a name like that. You know, it was it was you know it was Cool Herc or Mixmaster D or you know what I'm saying this and that. And for somebody to come out left field and be like Jazzy J, you know what I'm saying that's why you know it's always when you hear the name Jazzy J, you have to consider that that is the original and it was an original name at that time because you know that's where I saw it after the put originality and doing something and breaking ground where no one ever has ever done it before you know absolutely so we're talking about the mid-70s here so you're now jazzy j the original dj jazzy j so so when did you get down with uh africa bambata and the zulu nation well basically i was i you know i bounced around i used to hang out in another project called Soundview Projects a lot, me, my boy Sundance, who was uh, the brother of one of the members of the Jazzy Five, it was like, first it was Jazzy J and uh, and, and just the Jazzy Jazzy 2 MC, and that was uh, Sundance and um, Kid Cassidy. Okay. And, and, you know, they, we were all just like young kids, just like dabbling around, you know. We take the headphones, stick it in the microphone jack of, of the mixer, and that was your microphone because we couldn't afford a microphone. So basically in Soundview, we, we started, you know, started listening to, uh, you know, different groups that were out there at that point in time and, and, and started formulating our own type of game plan on how we was doing. And out of this level, from the two MCs that I had, that uh, Sundance's brother Ice got down. Then we got a couple other members. And then we used to actually, me and Sundance was actually, before I even got down with Dan Bader, used to play with uh, Cat and Disco King Mario. And uh, the, the, what, made that, what made that union kind of interesting is because I was from Bronx River, and Mario used to play, just like his name stated, a lot of disco songs. Right. So... Sam Bada was known for having the uh, all, all of the, the beats and, and, and the different percussive rhythms and, and all of the funk and, you know, just weird, a, a, a collage of, of abstract music. So being that I'm from Bronx River, I used to kind of like sneak around and get the names and, you know, me and my partner, Africa Islam, used to go down on wrecking hunts down, down in the village and down in lower Manhattan and, uh, you know, 42nd Street, what have you, and hunt for records. So when I went to Mario, it was like, hey, he got the best of both worlds. Now he's got a DJ that can actually DJ, and he's got the songs that he was never able to play because they, you know, he never knew them. A lot of band body songs used to have the labels covered up. They'd have the labels steamed off, you know, different ways of, of, of concealing and not giving up the identity of certain songs because you wanted to be the DJ that, that was known for bringing that particular song to fruition, bringing it out to the masses, you know? Right. So being that I, I discovered what a lot of those songs were and actually was doing my own type of digging, so, you know, I'd go downtown and, you know, you'd buy 30, 40 records, and out of the 30, 40, maybe three of them might be good. <laughs> you get back home with this whole armful of records that you just finished digging all day. <laughs> right. They all got- clothes all dusty and everything that you get home and you start going through these records and out of these 30 40 records you done spent all this money on you got three of them maybe that you could probably play at the next jam wow so so basically on the heels of that i caught i kind of caught slack from both sides because when i went to to mario you know i i wasn't accepted that the cat the cats in bronxville didn't didn't really want to accept me and uh i kind of got bent so mario's kind of used my records and his DJs were playing. So a DJ then Mickey D, he was Mario's DJ. Mario was more of the guy that would get on the microphone and kind of excite the crowd. And Mickey D used to spin the record. And then I had to watch, I had to sit in the background on my hands and pass this dude my records and watch him play 
all the records that I spent my money on and everything like that. Wow. So, uh, yeah, then one day Mario gave me a shot, and then everybody was like, yo, who's that young kid? Yo, he's nice. He's just, it was like, wow, why did he fuck up and do that? Nah, he got, gave me the shot. I got up on the mix and did my thing. And then since then, you know, I started like going on making sort of a name for myself. As time went on, me and Mario kind of separated and everything like that. And before we separated, you know, Bambada played with on Disco King's Mario setup at this park called Rosedale Park, uh, in between Bronx River and uh Bronx Sale. And that day Bambada started passing me records and uh, and we're both playing on Mario's set because Mario was known for having the big sound system, the whole full nine. And we're playing, so we kind of developed a rapport because of the fact before that, I used to go to Bronx River, I'd get ragged on because I was a traitor. I'm, if I'm bringing the Zulu beats over to the enemy. <laughs> mm, got you, wow. It was, it was still that rivalry from, from the gang days. The, right. The, gang, the, the, the black spade in, in Bronx River didn't get along with the with the skulls and the spades and the reapers and whatever in Bronxdale and so on and so forth and any any gangs in the other territory. So it was always that rival, even though it kind of still simmered out a lot, it was still an underlying factor in the background, you know? So when when that happened, it was cool. So when me and Mario finally broke up, I started putting the Jazzy Five together. We started doing our little routines and getting our little things together. You know, I'm perfecting my skills and perfecting my techniques on how I deliver my music to the, you know, to the audience and everything like that. Right. And yeah, and then one day, Van Bada's turntables broke down, and one of the one of the original members of the Zulu Nation. I'm talking about when it was only seven. Now, he, you know, members all around the globe, right? All around, you know, everywhere. But I remember when it was only seven. <laughs> you know. What I'm wow. Saying? Okay. I I, I, I could name I, I I could name them by name. And uh, one of the original members, he lived in my building, Artie J. Iz. He lived on the uh, I think on the fourth floor, and he came upstairs. His band by the turntables broke, and he said, "Yo, I got this this kid in my building, Van. You see him? He's nice. He got his own set of turntables and this and that. And uh, Bam, Bam uh." told him to come ask him would, would he lend me his would I lend him his my turntables and I before I could before he could get the words out of his mouth I had the turntables packed up in the back in the box and I was at Bam's house like of course fire you, you, you can borrow my turntables and it turned out that not only did uh did, did, did he play on my turntables which was a blessing enough for me he could have probably kept them and I probably would have never even said nothing right but he also invited me to play with him that night at, uh, I think, with Slow Bomb Projects out in Yonkers. And I went, went played with him that night, and the rest was history. That was uh, the beginning of Africa Bambada and Jazzy J, as you know, you plainly see. Right. Wow. Wow. So so uh, I, I want to dig just a little deeper in, in, in you, because DJ Jazzy J, you are a turntablist by definition. You, you, uh, mm -hmm. you scratch and tricks and the whole nine so how did you approach your djing technique and skill because it looked like you know you were honing it in and you had the jazzy five prior to getting down with bambata you were down with mm -hmm. disco king mario how did you hone in your skill what was your approach to your djing well, skills well i used to listen to a lot of the late night radio shows like uh when frankie clocker had like chef nunez and all of these guys and and you know it was like listening to a, a professor, how they used to take songs, but they had a different approach. They said they had what's called like the disco transitional mixes. And they would take these songs and mix two songs together. And then the blend would take like, like they'd blend one song and blend it into the next song. And that, that fade between one song to the next song used to last sometimes 30, 40 seconds, sometimes even a damn damn minute. You know what I'm saying? Right. And our thing was, we couldn't do that because of the fact that, more or less, we were trying to get away from the disco. We were rebelling against what was on radio. Only time I would listen to the shows, I would listen for the techniques and how they put these songs together. So that's basically my first introduction was trying to get records to flow smoothly so that people didn't trip up. A lot of DJs that came before, like myself, Theodore, Grandmaster Flash, Grand Mix of DXT, Charlie Chase, uh, a lot of DJs that came before us just used to just throw records in. 
You know what I'm saying? It right. Was, it, you know, it was, it was it was new, so the records used to get thrown in. And then I noticed how, you know, I would hear, being a drummer, it would bother me because of the fact that as a drummer, you are the timekeeper of all the instruments that, that are in the band. So developing the skill and techniques to keep the beats flowing, to keep the, the, the rhythmic flowing from one song into the next song so that people don't even know the next song then came in and then they're dancing to a completely different sound, different arrangement, and everything like that. That was my that was my approach to have that happen, but not to have it like to, to a point where I have crazy time. I got two minutes, four minutes to to, to decide how to blend the song in. Most of the beats we played were like little thirty second, twenty second, even two bars or uh, uh, chops that you had to catch it, and so you had to learn how to catch it on beat and be able to cue it, catch it, and all of that without without skipping a beat or without screwing up and having the beat just jumble eye all in because that was the mark of a good DJ where he can could, could catch those beats and actually have a cohesive flow. So once we developed a cohesive flow, then we had to actually add accents and all of that. That's where guys like myself, Graham with the Theodore, Graham after Flash, all that, we started like improvising to actually put our own our own signature onto you know that's where you got the cuts involved the uh, 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 the quick chops and all of that. It wouldn't be till later on when I saw a guy named Grand was the theater go zoop 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 boom bap bap ba boop bap on Apache and I said wow the game has really changed now now you're taking the the, the record itself and you're outside queuing and manipulating the manipulating the beats. And this would be go. This would go on to become a style called scratching. And now, when you start incorporating all of those styles, which I kind of incorporated, you know, the backspin technique, which you would catch. Uh, it was hard to keep picking up the needle and going to the beginning of a like, especially if the break was in the middle of the song. Right. And going to that nice part on that record and catching it, and then if, the, if it was only like four, eight bars being able to go to the next one and catch it and catch it and catch it real quick on beat. So when, when Flash kind of came up with the backspin technique, or as he calls it, the clock theory, you know, Flash is always technical with his, his, his terminology. <laughs> right, right. The quick so, the quick yeah, mix, so, right? Yeah, the quick mix and all of that. That's what you know. You you had to always, always perfect all of those different styles. And I think that's what kind of... That's what kind of uh, introduced me to, like, becoming one of the premier DJs at that point in time. You know what I'm saying? You know, I consider myself at, at, at one point in time back in that LSB, like, probably if not one of the best, the best at one point in time. You know what I'm saying? We all I got all got our little 15 minutes in the fame and the spotlight. So, you know, more or less, it's just like, you know, just having that interest, like, the you know, like the turntablists of today, where they, they're in the house practicing, you know, 8, 10, 12 hours a day. I used to do the same thing. You know what I'm saying? I Sometimes I go a whole day without eating because I'll be behind my turntables all day. That's all I wanted to do. You know what I'm saying? So, right. You know, once, once you do something to that extreme, you have no choice but to get a, a level of perfection that nobody else has achieved. So, you know, and, and, and that's like the dedication that, you know, that you apply to it is what you get back from it. So basically, I mean, that's kind of like the whole history of uh, how I got involved and how I perfected my craft and became the uh, the name that I was and had people wanting to follow and mimic my style of playing, as, you know, as opposed to listening to other cats. And then, you know, it didn't it didn't hurt at all having Bambada pass me records and me being able to cut up songs that nobody else had and could play. So it was like an unfair advantage, you know, to have that that level of skill and then also have that 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 uh, uh, selection of music. And, and, you know, it gave us like kind of a, 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 an advantage that, you know, that a lot of people couldn't even uh, rise to that, you know, to that level. Right, right. So I want to talk a little bit about that time frame for you. So let's lay it out just a little bit. So Cool Herc, Africa Bambata, and Grandmaster Flash are uh, credited to be the fathers of uh, the hip-hop culture. And all three of them are DJs. But they're all three different kind of DJs, correct? So w would Flash be the first person that you saw uh, manipulate the breaks and do the quick mix? I wouldn't say, I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't say 
the first, but he was he was one of the innovators that got it right. So got you know, you. A, a, a lot of credit went to him for for actually getting it right, and and and, and his style went on to teach him. You know, like cats like myself and Grand Wizard Theodore, and Charlie Chase, and Rock and Rob. And all, his style went on to influence us to take it to that next level to do what you know to do what we did after you know he introduced it. We had to embellish on it. So Flash would be that. Kirk would be that one that uh, he had that sound system, you know, the mighty Herculoid that, you know, when he came out, it was hypnotic. You know what I'm saying? When the beats came through the speaker and then he, was, he used to talk through that echo chamber and it was like, it was like, it, it was like the Lord, you know, Herculoid. It was like the Lord was speaking to you, you know what I'm saying? And certainly no certain uncertainty. So he was kind of like that, that mythological feature, creature that, you know, we used to all idolize. Gotcha. Bambada, Bambada was just like the kind of that that always been like a leader. He always had like like groves of people around him, and you know, and he had a, a ear for programming music that was impeccable. So you know, these are the three things that these guys brought to the table that made them made them stand out above like a lot of because there's a lot of other cats that started out in that same era. But they just didn't. They just, you know, some of them, some of them are long gone and forgotten. But I, you know, a lot of them, you know, I didn't forget, you know, you know. But more or less, it's like those three names stuck out because of the fact that they were always into something. Every week they was at a community center, at a, a at another different venue or outside at the park or doing something. And then it didn't it didn't hurt that they had their own had formed their own organization. Flash had the uh, uh, Black Door and, and the Casanova, uh, Herc had the Herculoids, you know, big, you know, his organization. Bambada had the, the Zulu Kings, the Zulu Nation, and and you know, Shaka Zulus, the whole full nine. So you know, each was kind of building up, building up an entity in its own and bringing in, cause, you know, bringing in people, and you know, that's that's what kind of made them stand out. And uh, you know, that's about that's about that situation. Got you. So did you end up uh becoming that DJ, the the battle DJ for Bambada? Oh yeah, I was the go to man. It was like Bambada would Bambada would usually open up and you know, I'd usually always show up late and then when I show up everybody's like, Oh yeah, okay, he's getting ready to go down now. I was kind of the secret weapon. So, you know, basically it all kinda came like uh, even 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 though a lot of people knew me in, in, in Bronx River and those areas in the Bronx that I played at because they was like, yo, oh, you know, he's nasty, he's better than this. You know, they always want to compare you to somebody else if you if, if, if you if you spark that in people. And I think uh, the, the time when when I when I actually knew that I had arrived was they had a battle of the DJs at uh, the T Connection up in the Bronx, which was a famous club we used to play in uh, uh, back in the days, and you know. I, we just everybody just knew it was going to be either between Flash or Theodore, and you know it was it was good because that night I kind of whipped up on both of them one night, and these were I mean I was nervous as hell. I couldn't I I had the butterflies in the stomach. I just knew I was like ah uh, you know what I'm I'm gonna go in here just do my best, but you know what uh, don't expect don't expect me to win because I know Flash and Theodore are gonna bring their A game, and you know what. Turned out that uh, I came in second place with Kid, God rest the dead, came in first. Yes. And and it was it was crazy for me because it was almost a tie. But then you know I guess with with out out to be uh, you know uh, uh, edge edge me out whatever the deal is. But for somebody who thought they they wouldn't even be in the rankings, that came as a big shock to me because I gotta admit you know you know you if you're a DJ. You know that feeling when you got that night when it seemed like everything falls into place, everything goes according to plan. Right. Everything you, everything you, you know, it's like one of them, uh, 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 the people that work hard to get into the Olympics, and then they have that flawless, and then they hold up them, they hold up the numbers, and you're like, wow, I did it! All of that hard work got paid off, and I think that was one of those nights for me, because you know I tell it a lot of the younger DJs, I'm like, you know. All you DJs that just start now and think that you know everything is just gonna be handed to you, I said it don't it don't work like that. I said you ain't a real DJ until you have one of those nights where 
you know, you got everybody eating out the palm of your hand. You got them sweating so hard that they they they, they don't want to stop. They're coming up to you. They 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 giving you accolades. And I said, but on the flip side of that coin, you ain't a DJ until you done got the whole salad bar thrown at you. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you done got a bomb so bad right. that you knew you like, oh man. But it ain't what you it ain't what you did. It's what you do to come back from all of that. Right. And I said, you know. I've been on both sides of that coin, and you know, the, even the, I, I think the, the 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 bad nights even helped me out more than the nights when everybody was just like you know all on my shit. The bad nights was the ones that made me go home and and really dig deep into my into my repertoire and come out and say, yo, listen, you got to just perfect your game and and go to another level. I was always looking for different things to do and and, and different ways to approach the art of DJing. So that, you know, I was always uh, uh, reinventing myself. So at that particular battle at the T-Connection, was Flash and Theodore in the battle? Yeah. Wow, very nice. So you came in second. Where's Kid came in first. So w- was this the, the same battle, this uh, legendary story of you and Africa Islam going after Flash and Theodore to battle them? W- is this the same night or was that something different? Uh, this, was, this, was, this was something totally different. I don't think Islam was in, in that battle that night. You know, basically, uh, you know, I, I would I would go on to, you know, to before they started recognizing that, oh, we got, you know, I got my little plaques from back in the days from here and there and, you know, whatever. Most of them are still in, 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 at my mother's house in the projects where, you know, all of the older stuff. But uh, more or less, um, you know, I became, I, I, I not only did I, you know, play, you know, back up for BAM, but I was always, always doing my own thing with my group with the Jazzy Five or with the Cosmic Force or, you know, or, or just doing my own thing in general. So uh, basically, I was, I was always just, like I said, just, just doing my own thing and just, you know, just trying to evolve. Was this all in the 70s or did, did this bleed off into the 80s, this time frame that we're talking about right now? This was majority, by then it was like the, the 78, 77, 78, 79, you know what I'm saying? That's when it, it started to be really become like a, one, one of those things where, you know, you had to be there to feel the energy. It, it, it wasn't something that that we got paid a whole lot of money for. We did it for the, for the love of the music and to try to be the best at what we did. You know what I'm saying? Where, you know, it's, it, it, the roles are flipped these days. Everybody, is, it, 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 they, 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 they equate you by how much you make. You know, you know, doesn't matter if, if you're a porn star and, and you're making all of these millions of dollars, you can't play, you can't even DJ. You just got a, a controller in front of you and you're pumping your fists or a computer, you're pushing buttons. Right. And, and, and I think you're a great DJ because you're making all this money. Now, nah, this was like, you got, that was the Aberdeen proving ground. If you wasn't a good DJ, trust me, the crowd would let you know it. They would let you feel it. They, they would send you home with your turntables underneath your uh, underneath your arm. <laughs> you know right, what I'm saying? right, right. So it looks like we're in the late 70s, we're going into the 80s, right? And Jazzy J is doing his thing. I want to talk a little bit about, you know, th- these early, like when you got into starting to, uh, you know, record music, you know, with the Jazzy Five, you put out a single called Jazzy Sensation. But also, aside from the recording, I know you played in a lot of legendary clubs like uh, the Ritz, the Roxy, Danceteria, and you played just Self in the iconic classic film Beat Street. Don't hold that against me. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, you know, I know a lot of people got funny things to say about the film, but I like the film Beat Street. So talk to the me person, about that that whole that whole scene and what was going on with you at that time. Well, at that time, you know, we were hated by the club DJs because it was like, uh, you know, they, was, they, they were used to being the, the, the stars of the show. Until we took over the turntables, you know, I'd go like to Barnes International, you know, you had Larry LeVans and all that. And these guys were, you know, they were phenomenal with the club spinning, with the, with the controlling of the, uh, the sound in, in and out, dropping the bass and all of that. And then we come on within, within a half an hour, they probably play like three songs. In half an hour, we'd probably go through like maybe 25 songs, cutting up beats and everything like that and doing tricks and everything like that. So basically, in that era, I was playing at, at just about all when we migrated from 
just doing stuff on the street level in the Bronx and Harlem and in, in the five boroughs. And we graduated to coming straight down to Manhattan playing for a whole different sector of people. You know, white people weren't coming to Harlem. They wasn't coming to the Bronx. They wasn't coming to Hollis, Queens, and, and, and Brooklyn especially. <laughs> you know right, what I'm saying? Right, right. So when we went downtown and now they recognized our skills and we got opened up to a whole broader audience, then white people will flock all. I mean, we started at Negrels. That was That's what sparked it off. And then from the grills, it just branched out to, you know, people speaking us out, you know, people coming from, from Japan. To, you know, I remember having film crews come in, filming my whole day. They come to my, my mother's house. I, I got to get up out of the bed because I got a film crew outside in the hallway. And I got to I gotta get up. And they film me while I'm brushing my teeth. I'm like, yo, dude, a little privacy here. Wow. You know what I'm saying? That's when the interest was really high. And, you know, it was it, it was like, you know, you, they follow us around all day. I get up and do my routine. Get up, go get me a haircut, wash my car. You know what I'm saying? Go go to go to uh, Juman, buy me an outfit, do pair of kicks. And then, you know, you be ready for the night. Once you, you know, you're ready for the night, go hit the club. And, you know, I used to play at several clubs in, 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 a, in a night. Go play uh, a couple of hours at this club. Go play a couple of hours at that club. Then end up, end up the night at the after-hour spot, you know, sitting there, sitting there either relaxing or hop on the turntables, you know what I'm saying? So it was a welcome thing because they, op- they, they welcomed us with open arms because we were unique from anything that they ever saw at right. that time. So, wow, okay. You know, the early 80s, you know, breaking into that scene was – was remarkable because that's what led to us becoming part of the movie Beach Street and you know and all on all of that so on and so forth. How did you end up in the film Beach Street? Uh, because of the fact that they uh, Arthur Baker was the, uh, the music director and you know Arthur Baker had uh, involved had worked involvement with uh, Planet Rock one of you know one of our biggest songs you know uh, Harry Belafonte wanted the group in the film itself. Not only that he wanted to have Bam. Bambada helped him uh, uh, kind of like coordinate with, with, with writing the film because, you know, it, a lot of scenes that were taken out, like the gang scenes and, and different scenes, because I, 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 somewhere around in my collection, I have the original, all of the original outtakes and, wow. and stuff like that from the movie. And the original movie was like something like three hours and change long, and it looked more like a documentary than a movie. By the time they brought in like two or three different directors, uh, they, they finally ended up with Stan Latham, you know, you know, Sanaya Latham's father. Right. Who actually a little bit of a little bit of footnote in the movie when I, the only speaking part I had in the movie was what hey double K come up. It wasn't even my voice. That was Stan Latham's voice. Or or the thing. They were like, Yo, Jay, man, what, what happened to your voice, man? All of a sudden you go to call the guy up on the stage, you go, hey, double K. <laughs> Come on up. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> at that time, you know, I'm like, what, like 20 years old, you know what I'm saying? Wow. So I was like an old man who was smoking cigars for all his life, you know? Yeah, they, you know, that, that opened up a lot of possibilities and, and, a, and a lot of a lot of the, uh, the limelight spots for us. You know, we started doing traveling all around the world, you know what I'm saying? And at that point, now I'm no longer a B-boy, but I'm playing for all of the B-boys, the Rocksteady crew, the Dynamic Breakers, the New York City Breakers, and we're going on, we're going all the way to Sweden, Japan, Paris, you know, London, you know, we're going all over the place. So, you know, I, hey, listen, it was a, it was a great time for me, you know, it was, a, it was that, you know, the, the, the boys from the project make good type situation, you know, that Cinderella story type thing, you know? Right, right. So, so talk to me about, uh, I mean, you, you had mentioned Arthur Baker, you know, and, and his, uh, his involvement with producing, you know, uh, Planet Rock and the Beat Street soundtrack. So talk to me about the Tommy Boy record situation and now you becoming a recording artist and releasing Jazzy Sensation. Well, well uh, you know what, long story short, I don't want to get into the whole Tommy Boy situation, but uh, I was actually the only one out of the, uh, out of the soul, the original members of the Soul Sonic, uh, Africa Bad Models, Soul Sonic Force that, that never signed the Tommy Boy contract because of the fact that uh, my mother worked for the New York court system. And at that time, you know, it was like, you know, we, we, we're under, we're kind of underage or just on that brink of 18 to 21 area, you know what I'm saying? Right. And do nothing about the music business, more or less negotiating the contract. And I remember we all got the contracts and everybody just was like, yo, oh, we're going to get paid. Let's just sign. I 
took it to my mom's who took it to one of the lawyers at the courts, and they were like, yo, tell your son if he signs his contract, he's a fool. So I never really signed the contract, but I was still always a member of the group. But I was never really signed to Tommy Boy, uh, uh, you know, at all, because uh, I refused to sign the contract, which was a good thing because it, it, it allowed me not to get locked into a 10-year, get ripped off deal right. where, where everything I did belonged to, it was a it was sole property of Tom Silverman and Tommy Boy Records. I was able to go on to do other things. I worked for every label from Electra to CBS to Warner Brothers to Next Plateau, even to the, to the smaller labels like Profile, Select, Emergency, all the little labels. So I was I was able to do a lot of production, a lot of performances, a lot of a lot of you know scratches or whatever they need at that point in time because you know I didn't need an excuse to get it. You you told me it, go play at a party. I'm there. Go play, go up in the recording studio. I'm there. So uh, you know that that was that was my life. Just like you know, music totally, music above everything. So in the midst of all of this, it looks like you ended up getting on the radio as well on a, a Kiss FM. Is that correct? Yeah, I was the first. I was the first DJ to uh, uh, do Kiss FM. The show that Red Alert still does to today was the show that that was my show that I handed to Red Alert because Red Alert was actually gonna he was gonna retire. This was woo, going back in the early eighties. He was like ready to retire. Wow. I was like. Uh, don't do that, man. Or just give me give me a week. I'm gonna have something for you. And then uh, I brought uh, Red Alert to two people that 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 uh, that that started that that mix show because of the fact that I used to do the my mix show used to be from uh, midnight to three o'clock in the morning. And on the other end of the dial was uh, Magic and Molly Ma. I mean, matter of fact, I even started before Magic. Magic was still on HBI. This was before he even came to BLS. He came to BLS sometime in the middle of my uh, residency uh, over there at Kiss. But then uh, I started, you know, doing the college circuits. I was doing like, all, of the, all of the college up and down the East Coast and the West Coast. So I didn't really have time to just uh, keep doing those uh, those mixes every Saturday. So that's when I brought uh, Red Alert in. But I was, I was like, yo, Cuzzo, don't even sweat it, man. I got you. And then uh, he eventually brought Chuck Chu out in, and, you know, they've been doing their thing ever since. Right, right. And you would say this was mid-'80s, right? Yeah, yeah. Like early to mid-'80s. Early, mid, like, like, uh, this would be like 83, 84 in that era. So 83, 84. And, uh, and you said <laughs> and you gave the show to Red Alert, who's your older cousin, cool DJ Red Alert. So, so on top of everything that you're already doing, you, you end up getting into radio. So now I want to talk about, we're talking about 84, 85. Now I want to talk about the chapter in your career that... <laughs> That I don't believe you get enough credit for or if you get credit at all. So talk to me about the fact that in 1984, you helped Rick Rubin create the whole concept of Def Jam Records and helped starting the record label, correct? Def Jam was the idea that Rick Rubin brought to me when I was playing in Dance Interior. He used to come to Dance Interior, stand there all night watching me play. And then he got up the nerve one night to come and sit down and talk to me and Afterwards, we came. We became friends. We, we became hang, hangout buddies. You know what I'm saying? And he came to me with a couple of different projects. I think it was a Sex Piston project that we he wanted me to help him remix. And then uh, he was like, "Listen, you want to start a label?" And like I said earlier, basically to be in the studio, no problem. To be in the in the club, no problem. Anything had to do with music. You know what I'm saying? Hey, you want me to get back on the drums? Shit, no problem. I do all of that. He was like, yeah, I'll think about starting a record label. And that was the concept. We sat down, we talked about it. We was like, all right, let's do it. But it, back in those days, like I said, still inexperienced in the business end of it. It was just a handshake between two friends. And uh, we went in the studio, me, myself, uh, T. Rock, who's Special K's brother, because Special K had signed one of those Tommy Boy type deals with Sugar Hill. And in, uh, which they inquired from Bobby Robinson from Enjoy Records, they inquired the Treacherous Three, and they couldn't, he couldn't do nothing outside of his scope of his contract. So that's when he got his older brother, T, uh, 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 Terrence, uh, uh, he got T to actually do the lyrics. Special K wrote the lyrics, where it's yours. Me and Rick Rubin put together the, the production, and we went, Rick Rubin went, brushed them up, you know what I'm saying? And for, for a year, It's Yours was out a year. I think It's Yours came out the end of 83 and 83, beginning of 84. And for like a year, 
it was a sleeper. The record, nobody would play it. We were selling records out of the trunk of our car, and it was like an underground hit in, in, in the underground clubs. But we wasn't getting no radio play. We wasn't getting no pre real exposure. And then all of a sudden, like maybe eight months to a year later, the record just blew up. Wow. And everybody wanted us, man. It was like, it was because it was the first record that had that much faith. It started a trend. Before that, people were, oh, were trying to be anatomically correct. They wanted the record more or less recorded like the rock and roll record with the tight kick drum and, you know, the punchy, punchy big snare and everything like that. This had that little tap, tap snare from the 808 and that huge ass 808 drum that everybody, their mama used. But it's yours was like one of the first songs to, to actually actually take that because I remember we were, we were in Power Play Studio when we were recording it, and the guy was like, well, "Look, you're pinning the meters. That's not going to sound right." He was, Rick was like, "Nope, turn it up. I want more bass. I want more bass." And I was looking at Rick. I'm like, "Yo, dude, I think we might have oversaturated this with bass." But he's like, "Nah, sounds great. Sounds great." And to this day, I remember we used to go back and forth. The quite a little story. This was before Luke Skywalker became Two Live Crew and Uncle Luke and all of that. He used to bring me and Tila Rock out to Florida, and they used to have these car shows where they would have all, the, you know, the big sound systems and these dancing bed trucks. And everybody, when they battled one car to another car, everybody had It's Yours on because it was the baseiest song at that time out that everybody knew when they put that in, they speakers would get a workout flow. So it was, it was like a groundbreaking thing. Right, but, right. Like I said, uh, you know, like I said, when you, got a, when you got a situation where it's a handshake between two friends and you got one person that has their eye on, hey, listen, I'm all, I, my thing was all, always about, I'm, I'm all about the music. And I didn't watch my, I didn't watch my six. And Rick was always all about, I want the, I want the fame and I want the money. And that's where, that's actually kind of where we, where we were at. And when I introduced him to Russell Simmons, he figured out, well, Russell got Curtis Flow, he's got Goudini, he's got Disco, he got Run DMC. So he figured Russell could take him to the next level. And when Russell, they were like right minds, because so basically neither one of them really had too much any talent at that time. They just had a, a knack for getting deals. And with Rick Rubin in the pot, you know what I'm saying, he was connected in a way that nobody really realized because, you know, him being white, he was already connected to uh, certain powers to be within the music industry, and they was they was willing to give him the money before they was given. They wasn't giving a million dollars to me. They wasn't giving a million dollars to Russell. But this kid still in college, <laughs> half Russell age, and years younger than me. They would give him a million dollars. You know wow. what I'm saying? It was wow. yeah. And, and I quote: I heard I sat in on one of his meetings, and I ain't mentioning no names, but. The record company exec said, yeah, well, you know what I'm saying? We're going to give you the money, and you keep the monkeys in check. And I was like, okay, I see where this is going. Wow. And my thing my thing was I always wanted a recording studio because I was always into – I'm a technical geek. And uh, my thing is I didn't, I didn't really, I didn't really like, like care too much about the record thing, record end of it. I just always wanted to sit in a place where I'm surrounded by music all the time. So – when I got kind of phased out of that situation and, and Rick realized Rick realized that, oh, all I got to do is sign this paper because there's no record. I can, I can take this company and run because, uh, you know, saying basically uh, my name is on everything. When he realized that it was, easy, it was easier to just, like, go ahead and, and do everything himself without having any partners. And then Russell was a businessman, so Russell wasn't going to allow that to happen to him because that's all he was doing was the business end of it. And I got phased out of that. I had no bad intentions because of the fact that the way uh, I'm a proud person and the way I was brought up, is, you know, if it's something somebody don't want you around or involved with them, you know what I'm saying, you'd be a fool to be at that horse. I know in business it's like, nah, you got to kick that door down. But I was like, man, listen, you know, I did it once with this dude. I could do it again because he couldn't have did it without me. Now, the other way around, I could have did it without Rick. He could have never did it without me. So right, right. basically, that was, the, that was the name of that thing. But uh, yeah, Def Jam, the, the first uh, distributed ne network of Def Jam was out of the trunk of my 1979 Chevy Caprice Classic. 
We sold records out of the trunk of that car for a better part of a year and uh, to start our record label because you got to understand the first three records on Def Jam is all me. 001 is It's Yours. 002 is Cold Chilling in the Spot. 003 is the Def Jam. All three first songs on Def Jam was all Jazzy J songs. Right. Now, with, with those three records, those they were distributed by Party Time, right? It was Def Jam, Party Time? Only only It's Yours. Only It's Yours. It's yours. Yeah, we went into uh, P&D, which is a question and distribution deal with Arthur Baker. Uh, and that was, that was like I said, that was Rick's uh, thing. My thing was, you know what? We made that song. I'm in the studio making the next song. I'm in the studio making the next song. That's why, you know, I applaud like all of the producers right now that are in the studio and they're banging out, banging out song after song. But they they got either somebody watching their back, or their business minded enough to, to 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 make sure all of the paperwork and all of that is is, is correct as far as like their royalties and everything, and they, them getting themselves paid from all of their hard work. Right. So right. Uh, me, I was just focusing on the music, but I had nobody really to watch my back, and I didn't have to really the knowledge and everything in that in the, in that era of it because it was you know I'm still green. And with that, you know, I'm used to collecting money at the door from the parties or, you know what I'm saying, going in and doing a live performance or on the drums and getting paid for a session or stuff like that. The fathom of, of, of mechanicals and selling records and keeping track of, 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 of that, that, that wasn't, that wasn't in my repertoire at that time. It wouldn't be till later on, you know, after, after, I, after I opened up Jazzy J recording studio and started Strong City Records that I realized the value of keeping all your publishing, your mechanicals and making sure your name is on everything. So no matter what happens, if it takes off or it flops, you know what? You in there for a penny for a pound. For, for you know, for everything. Absolutely. So I want to get to that too, but but I want to pull back something else. So you helped Rick Rubin star Def Jam. You put out It's Yours, which is a classic record, and then of course you had the other two singles, Cold Chilling in the Spot and Def Jam. But but before you were phased out from the early Def Jam years, what were you? Because I don't think people know these things either. What was your involvement in that first Beastie Boys album and LL's first <laughs> records? Well, hello. I basically mixed because at that point in time, I was still, I, I you know, I, I well, as much as as far as I figured, I was still co-owner of the record company. It was just a record company between Rick Rubin and myself. And when when he when he brought LL in and let me listen to the cassette, I was like, all right, let's do it. Not a big deal. So in between the LL working on the LL album, that's when the everything when the shit started hitting the fan because I got I got left in New York. With a bunch of beats, me and uh, an engineer named Steve Vett, and I got left with a bunch of beats, and I had to make songs out of them. And Rick was in in California cutting a deal for for some millions of dollars. I knew nothing about it. I wasn't even invited to the to the to the meeting or anything. So that that's how that went down. Wow. With the BC BC boys are uh, uh, ever since they you know they've been around us since since the beginning. Uh, the record, first record they did, Cookie Puss, you know, nobody wanted to play it. I was the only one playing it, basically. And and uh, the song Brass Monkey, I actually did that song. And, you know, uh, more or less, I, did, I didn't really see the Beastie Boys going where they were going. <laughs> I said, okay, you know what, I don't think people are going to gravitate to this because at that time, the sound was totally different than what was, uh, their sound was totally different than what was out there. But I worked on both of those albums, uh, you know, and, and it was just, you know, it was just, like I said, just me being up in the studio, being in my element. If that's, that's where the music was going down, that's where I was. Right. So from my understanding, you, again, please correct me if I'm wrong. I'm just trying to uh, paint the picture of a lot of things that you didn't get credit for. I, I got a little credit for doing a remix on the, on the LL album, and in, in actuality, I am the original cut creator. I did all the cuts on, the, on just about the whole album and some of the some of the arrangements and some of the beats. But uh, I didn't get credit for none of that. I hear you. Funny story. I remember when the album went gold and I called Rick up. I'm like, yo, yeah, I see everybody getting gold records. What, what the hell's my gold record? He said, oh, you want one? I'm like, you goddamn right. I worked on that fucking album when your ass was sitting on a beach in California. Let me get my motherfucking gold. So. You know, I got a go. I got a go for uh, uh, Rock the Bells. I mean, radio album. 
But um, more or less, you know, it, it, it's, it's like, you know, I know that album probably went double and triple platinum or whatever. I never got another black from it or no, no, you know, no acknowledgement or anything like that. But, you know what I'm saying? It, it is what it is. I live on and I, I right, go right. on to do it. So, so long story short, because I want to go ahead and get onto your studio and your record label, uh, Strong City Records. So you did the cuts on Rock the Bells and a lot of programming and arrangements and majority of the scratching on LL's first album, Radio, and the Beastie Boys' License to Ill album. Is that correct? Well, I did do a lot on the Beastie Boys. I think the Brass Monkey and maybe a couple of other like cuts in between here and there and, and effects. Cause, uh, I was, at that point in time, I was kind of moving into like, yo, I, 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 I was feeding to open up a recording studio. So I was trying I, I was trying to get out of a situation where, you know, I felt I was no longer needed. So, you know what? I'm not staying nowhere where I'm not wanted. So I was trying to move out of that situation and then, uh, and trying to move into a record, uh, into my, I said, if I, if I did things correctly, according to the business terms, I could have probably opened up 10 recording studios. But in, in my narrow mind, I knew what I knew what I wanted to do, and I was going to chase that dream. Absolutely. So talk to me a little bit about Jazzy J Studio in the Bronx, and then you eventually launched your own record label, Strong City Records. Talk to me about that. Well, basically, I opened up the, the recording studio in, in like, uh, summer of 85. I, I started... Uh, Groundbreaking construction, the whole full nine. Built a, actually, it was a, uh, it was my first, my first apartment. So I went in there, you know, bought a bunch of equipment, reel the reels, make board, and all of that. You know, it was it was ghetto fied, but it was it was a legitimate studio for me. And you know, just started banging out productions, doing a little bit of this and that. And um, uh, eventually, you know, I started building up a clientele, people coming from uh, uh, from all over because the, the studio had more of an atmosphere that you felt more like a, a, a home environment than a stiff, stiff studio. Like most of the studios, you go downtown, they're looking at the clock. They're clocking you when you come in the whole full nine. Our studio was more relaxed. You know what I'm saying? The, the, the instruments were there for you to touch. And, you know, a lot of studios you went in downtown, you couldn't touch the board. You couldn't touch this. You couldn't touch that. So basically, I opened up a, 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 like a community studio where people came in and they learned as they were as they were uh, doing their thing, and uh, and and it was a way for me to generate money because I knew how to operate all the equipment. I stayed on top of the technology, and so I started, you know, I started get, stealing clients from all over the place, from a little bit of everybody's studio. Everybody was like, "Yo, the buzz is out. Yo, there's a studio up in the Bronx. They're doing great things." And for, at first, I had, you know, it was in my apartment, little 16 track studio, hole in the wall, tool nine. But we, you know, we were, we were banging out stuff. And, and for, for a lot, I did a lot of production for a lot of labels, a lot of beats for a lot of labels and everything like that. And then, uh, I got, uh, approached by, uh, then Rocky Buchanan, who had a, a, a record labels, MLO, Music Lovers of the World. And he had a, a, a group called the Master of Ceremony. And they had a song called Crime. Right, and, right. Yeah, Crime was the, their first single they had put out on MLO Records. So Rocky brought them to me, which was, uh, Grand Poobah, Doctor Who, and DJ Chabaz. And then later on, we would bring in Don Barron for the Bon Diddly 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 Don Barron. You know, so what happened is we, he brought the group to me. We started, uh, you know, he was paying for studio time, and then he, you know, he we started working on this stuff. So he was impressed the way I, the way my professionalism, the way I worked, and how I put the productions and everything together. He approached me about starting a record label, and I turned him, I turned, I turned him down like at least about ten times. I was like, nah. After the bitter taste I had in my mouth with Rick Rubin, I said, if I ever start a record label again, I'm going to do it my way because I'm not getting phased out like that ever again. I'm not making that mistake again. So as, as, the, as the project uh, kind of uh, developed, we became more of a family than, than just like another, another client coming in, renting time at the studio. We became more of a family, I guess. Eventually, I said yes. And then that was the uh, seed that started Strong City Records. Wow, wow. So so the studio that you created, uh, that you opened up in the Bronx, uh, I mean, a lot of people, you know, a young a young Fat Joe and, you know, brand Nubians came through there, Tribe, and, and, and a lot of artists. A little bit of everybody, KRS-1, uh, um, Premier, uh, of course, like, the, you know, the whole DITC, Posse, 
with with Tommy D, Fat Joe, AG, Lord Finesse, uh, Big Pun, uh, Cuban Link, uh, Big L. You know, so more or less, like I said, the cats in the Bronx, we had a voice now because at Jazzy J Studio, J Studio is the lab, the lab. And that was the place for everybody, you know, I, I credit Diamond D for bringing in the whole DITC project because he was the first one, you know, when he worked with us since we had the first studio because there was two, two Jazzy J recording studios. The first one was the one that uh, we started recording all the Master Ceremony stuff, Busy Beat Suicide, and uh, we did all of that stuff in the first studio one. And then uh, when we opened up the new studio is when we got the deal. With, we, you know, we were pressing up Strong City Records out, out, out of that studio. And then we got the deal with MCA, and then that's when we, you know, we moved to a bigger place and opened up the, the second Jazzy J studio. So, like, everybody would come through because it was more, you know, even you, you at any point in time, you could see Ice-T hanging out, and then Latifah up in the front answering phones, you know what I'm saying? It was, it was that, wow. that type of, you know what I'm saying? So it, it was that, that type of environment where everybody would come through, and it was more like a family, a family situation than a business situation, you know what I'm saying? Right, Everybody, right. Everybody's creativity was able to flow more because they felt comfortable in their environment, you know? And that's what spawned you putting out your own album, right? Your own compilation album, correct? Yes, sir. Yep. We did we did we did a lot of stuff released and unreleased that was that that was smashed, but a lot of times we were kinda we were kinda on the cusp and I think we were ahead of our time. But you know, like I said, we would have I you know, I have been I've been I've been first on the first first thing for the longest i was the, you know out of the out of the era that i came from like i said we all established i was the first on major radio i was the first to open up a recording studio i was the first to start a record label i was the first to like even even in production wise we were the first to blend uh blues and hip-hop we were the first to blend reggae and hip-hop you know what I'm saying? So yes. it was a lot of first. That, it was a lot of first that you know that we uh, that I did under under my belt. That that you know a lot of a lot of people you know these days they they they, they wouldn't know unless they go back to the origins and the history of it. But you know, like uh, a lot of times we were just kind of ahead of our time, and a lot of people took it took them years, and then uh, even a lot of the same concepts and, and ideas that that we were responsible for bringing bringing out. People came out like years later with almost the same concept and was able to blow up, but, you know, at the time we came out with it, it was like music was going one way, and we was thinking already, like, years down the line, you know? Absolutely, absolutely. So is that what kept you busy throughout, you know, the 80s and 90s and, and the 2000s was the studio and the label? Yeah, yep, the studio, the label, plus I was still, I, I, I actually got sick of the road because of the fact that I was on the road so much between Soul Sonic 4, between uh, the Team of Rock stuff, between uh, uh, just doing my own gigs and jumping off planes, jumping off planes. And any anybody that, any artist that can tell you that spent any amount of time on the road in the beginning is lovely. After after a month or two into a tour, you ready to come the hell home. <laughs> you like, right. oh, let's get canceled the rest of these dates and get the fuck off this road. You know what I'm saying? It's the constant, you know, being tug of war. And so my safety zone and everything like that, I was quite content with sitting in the studio doing that. And I, did, I ran Jazzy J recording studio successfully for 10 years, from 85 to 95. You know what I'm saying? So it basically, that's a, that's, that's, that was like, that was my base of operation. And, you know, I, I did that to the, to the fullest extent. I'm assuming you still own the, the Strong City Records catalog, yes? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We still got the Strong City Records catalog. I still have interest uh, publishing in, 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 like, stuff like Black Rock and Ron, stuff uh, with Salt and Pepper, stuff with um, Next Plateau Records, some brand new beans, Diamond Days, the DITC stuff. It, it's like uh, all, all of the stuff that, that I did, I, I remember doing a night one night with I said I'm just gonna do play a night with all songs that I either was involved with or did straight out and we ended up doing a whole night like three, four, five hours of just nothing but music that, you know, that we did and, and rocked the whole party. Like, wow, we got we got like a, a, a extensive catalog here and a lot of people don't even don't even realize how many songs like, you know, I was directly involved with. Right. Uh, right. That, May not even see my name on, on the on the uh, thing because one thing about Jazzy J Recording Studio is that 
you know, a lot of people, a lot of, a lot of producers, and you know, a lot of uh, arrangers, and so, you know, we produce artists, or we produce tracks, or we produce beats. I was the kind of producer that produced producers. You know what I'm saying? Uh, you know, Skeff Anthem, he went on to become a producer. He worked underneath me. Diamond D went on to become a producer. Uh, uh, Law Finesse went on to become a producer. These are all cats that came out of the Jazzy J camp. Showbiz uh, went on to become Premier, went on to become, <laughs> I don't even need to tell you what that is. Right, you right. Know what I'm saying? A lot of cats, lot of cats you know, came out of, out of that camp. And they went on to do that. They went on to do a lot of great things. And to me, it feels like you know my work is still out there because these are cats that are extensions to the work that we laid ground for, and they they were able to take it and take it to to their own level, which is what you're supposed to do in music anyway. You know what I'm saying? Put your put your stamp on it and ride that and ride that horse. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely, absolutely. So I mean, you know, and and even aside from all of that, you know, you you have been highlighted. <laughs> Over the years, you know, I mean, you've been in multiple films. I mean, you were in Beach Street in 1984. You were in the uh, the documentary Scratch in 2001. Uh, Five Sides of a Coin in 2003. So, so many, many so many documentaries, right? So it's hard to even keep track of. It's like every time, like back in the days, like in the 70s, it's hard to find footage because there was a lot of footage that people didn't film a lot. Not like today where everybody got it. Uh, everybody walking around with a well, film studio in their pocket. Back then, they, 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 there's a footage of me. That, I mean, every time. And it started in the 70s and everywhere from Jay-Z's footage, from, from all kinds of documentaries on PBS and this and that. This one piece of footage. And the guy the guy that filmed it was a guy from uh, the BBC in London. And it's because I've been trying to get that footage back forever because I'm like, yo, it seems like any time, they mentioned hip hop, old school hip hop. This one footage just popped up with me, with me on the turntables and little Spivey uh, b boy in front of me on 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 a, on a piece of linoleum. And uh, you know, so you know, we were blessed, and I, I'm still blessed. You know, saying God has been good, and uh, you know, I wouldn't I wouldn't be able to do none of this without the people that support me, all my fans and everybody that that supported throughout the years. So you know, I'm always looking towards the future of doing the next great thing and doing the next best thing, you know what I'm saying? It's like right now, uh, I'm, I'm always uh, 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 still on the turntable, still doing my thing, thing, still rocking the club, still doing what I do. But at any point in time, I might feel like jumping back in the studio and hopping on some tracks and then finding out what the pulse is and changing it, changing everybody's heartbeat and then you dance to a different groove, you know how that goes. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, you you were also uh, inducted into the Techniques DMC Hall of Fame in 2000, which is incredible. But but I want to I want to ask you about one thing that's one of my favorites. I don't know how many people know about this, but talk to me about Hip Hop by Soundwalk. This was an audio tour that you could download the app and listen to your voice do an audio okay. tour of the Bronx. Talk to me about that. This was incredible. This, this, uh, the sound walk was a crazy concept when they came to me with it. And I, and before they, before it was an app, it was this, this before phones had apps <laughs> and it was a CD. You'd pop in the CD and it would walk you from like a Grand Central 42nd Street and it would tell you which train to take and it would be describing the surroundings. And it was, I, I, my sound walk was I narrated an uh, area through the Bronx and I did all the music scoring and all of that for it. And what it, it'll tell you what trains to go on. And when you get on the train, it provided you like 45 minutes worth of music, which would, we timed it would be the exact amount of music you would need to ride from there on the six train or the five and four or whatever, and then get off once you get off and you click in the second CD, that would take you, it would it would take you down Morris Avenue and point out the different places that some of the places that were still there, what happened in, in the in the blackout or blah blah blah. Oh, this was the, the where you see the new ranch restaurant that used to be the Army and Navy store, but after the blackout, no more Navy store. <laughs> you know what wow. I'm saying? Yeah, so it you know, it was like kind of comical, but it was it would walk you right straight up to Bronx River Center the backstage where a little bit of everybody who was anybody back in the days, if you didn't play on that, on that platform, on that stage, and uh, you hadn't arrived yet. And, you know, this was like all the breakouts of Cool Herc's or 
Flash, is the Bam Bada, is the the uh, 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 Disco King Mario, is everybody. If you were somebody, Disco, if you were somebody, you played on that stage, so it walked you through the projects and kind of like uh, and then when it's finished, you popped in the next CD, which will get you get you back to the train where you have another 45 minutes of, of music that we played back in the day to take you on your journey back home. And then it will end when you get to 42nd Street. And then from there, you know what I'm saying, you figure out your de designation to go back. So it came in good because a lot of people that came in town from other countries and they wanted that hip-hop experience and they wanted to walk through those neighborhoods that we once stomped on. That's what you would do. You would pop this in. And, and go. Now, like I said, they then got all technical. You can download the app and, and it will take you through everything. It will take you through Chinatown. If you get that Chinatown uh, uh, version, it will take you through this. They've even got them that you you can take they take you to a walk where Bob Marley played in Kingston, Jamaica, and this and that, and point out all of that. Wow. I thought it was a great, I thought it was a good concept, and you know, it was it was something interesting to work on, and then putting it together, I had a lot of fun putting that together. You know, it was it was, it was an experience for me because up until then I had never heard of somebody doing that, and I'm thinking I'm like, wow, is this gonna work? And then when when we when we finally put it everything together and edited it, I was like, wow, this is this is a nice little concept. I think this is good. You know? Yeah, I thought it was incredible when I first downloaded it and I listened to it. I mean, I literally felt like I was there in the 70s in the Bronx walking through you know the projects and the fields and on the train and it just was amazing and you were in my ear giving me the audio tour of the Bronx it was incredible and that was called Hip Hop by Soundwalk yep that was Soundwalk they got they got a few different areas that they do the one I did like I said is like a take you on the area like where I grew up in the Bronx uh, Bronx River Projects 174th Street I told them stories about how the black spades used to throw people off the bridge when, you know, you walk by that bridge and then circles you into the projects and takes you to the center of the projects. And then you can hear the music in the background coming up. Yeah, after the band is warming up to get started right there. So it gave you that feel like you were actually there. Yes. And, uh, yeah, and if you take the walk, cause a lot of people's like, yo, man, you know, a lot of people in projects, yo, a lot of these white people coming through. And they got they, they got the headphones on. They don't know they can get fouled on it. And I tell them, I say, yeah, listen, be mindful. They, be mindful. I know you got the headphones on. You listen to it, but be mindful of your surroundings. <laughs> you see, you right. going in the Bronx River, baby. You got on some headphones, looking around like, wow, wow. They're going to be up on you like, uh, yeah, 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 uh, what you got for me, <laughs> you know? <laughs> right, 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 right. It, you know, again, it was. It, I just wanted to mention it because I thought it was incredible. I loved it. And I love the fact that you did it. And uh, it, it was super, super, super cool. So, Jazzy J, you've done so much for the hip-hop culture. And you've done so much as a DJ and for the DJ culture. What's next for Jazzy J? Well, you know, right now, you know how they say you pass the torch down? My son took up where I left off on the drums. He's got a group called Phony People, you know, so I work, in, I work closely in conjunction to guide them on the right direction and d making them do what they got to do. And, and and right now they're blowing up all around the world, you know what I'm saying, all over the globe and all over the planet. So, you know, it's just passing the torch on. And like I said, you know, my work ain't, ain't, ain't complete, complete. More or less these days, I'm in the crib, I'm a homebody. You know what I'm saying? I ain't out in the street. Streets a little too crazy for Jay. I never thought I'd be the one saying that because I was a wild cowboy back in the day. Right. But uh, then I'm like more of a homebody. I sit here. I got my recording studio right here in, in my dungeon in my basement. And uh, I go up in there, let my let my thoughts uh, flow, do what I got to do. I'm always, go, I'm always buying new records. A lot of cats don't even know what vinyl is these days. But my vinyl collection is, is, is massive. And it always needs to be, needs to be regulated and redone this that man I'm, I'm sitting there going through about going through about eight thousand records right now trying to put them back in covers and you know so more or less i'm just i'm just doing my thing uh you know still doing the road thing still running around still being sponsored by different uh, equipment companies to test out their equipment to you know give my stamp of approval or my endorsement and you know just doing that plus i got my own sound company where I provide sound stage and lighting, you know what I'm saying? We just got in a massive, massive sound system that, you know, forty, fifty thousand dollars worth of equipment and we run around doing that, doing live shows, doing live mixing, wow. live bands. You know, so 
more or less, you know, I, I got my finger in a couple of pies, but you know, I'm still I'm still that cat, that humble cat from the projects that, you know what I'm saying, keep on doing, keep on keeping on, man. You know, that's just the way I've been raised, man. I'm and I'm gonna keep on doing this until they throw the dirt on me. I know, you know, uh, we've worked together with the Global Spin Awards in the past and more, more recently the Simon Day film that's coming out next year. Oh, oh, yeah. Well, I had a ball with that. I was starstruck and they were starstruck. I was like, what? Me? I said, man, when your guys was out, man, that was it, man. When I heard that boom, 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 boom. Right. Oh, man, that's, that's classic. Yeah, the, br- I, the know, brawl record, no question about it. Yeah, the brawl. And, uh, you know, it's like uh, I did, like, uh, you know, above and beyond. I had them film me while I, I did all of their albums and, and, and mixed, like, all of the songs and, 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 and like, a, like a collage and, and gave that to them. And they were, they were, they were ecstatic because they wasn't expecting that. But uh, I put that together for them. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, di- I'm, wait- I'm dying to see the documentary or the, the film when it comes out. I'm definitely always going to be a fan of Samantha, you know what I'm saying? They're Absolutely. Are, they're part of the sacred crates of hip-hop. Absolutely. And, see, and, and speaking of the sacred crates of hip-hop and hip-hop in general, do you feel like hip-hop's history has been told correctly? And how about your history? Do you feel like there's things left out or do you feel like it's been told as, as good as it can to this point? It's depending on who you speak to. It, it, you know, some people will tell the, the history according according to their archives. Some people research and find out. Some people that lived it will tell you the truth. Other people will try to rewrite it to include themselves in things that they had no part in. You know, I, I know there's a lot of DJs out there that deserve a lot of props, and they did their own thing, and, and I respect them for it. But you know how many DJs that I ain't going to even mention no names right now, but I think you got a good idea of some of them I'm talking about who try to write themselves into the history of hip hop and they couldn't stand hip hop. You had DJs that you, you, you went in there and you, you, you bust a move on the dance floor. They would tell security to throw you out. Wow. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Okay. You know, you went in there, you went in there with some, some jeans and some poke ass. Nah, man, you can't get up in here like that with that hippity hippity that hippity 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 shit clothes on. Man, get the hell on out of here. So and and now here it comes uh, years later. Oh, I started that, man. Yeah, I was before this person. I did this. I was like, no, you didn't. I said what you was doing was you was doing the same thing that uh Frankie Crocker and a lot of the club DJs you were following that too. Yeah, we you broke ground playing, doing this and everything like that. But we were trying to break away from the music. So it depends on who you talk to, how you're going to get the history. And then a lot of people just make shit up. <laughs> and that's the, that's the worst. Right. You got me, me and Kaz, I got this from Kaz. Kaz say, yeah, you got the pioneers and you got the lioners. Wow. You know, some cats, they'll lie through their teeth, man, just to include themselves. Man, you know, and you got cats that, oh, yeah, this, I started this. I started, I'm like, yo, dude, why I ain't never seen your name on a flyer? Right. You know what I'm saying? Right. I used to start that flyers from 1976, 77. You see my name on flyers. You see pictures of me at the, at the jam. And you know what? I got a history that I, I don't have to lie about it. I can tell you what happened at the Galaxy 5 under the night theater. They, they shot up the place and Theodore was still playing music with the speakers with bullet holes in it. You know what I'm saying? But if you talk to 10 different people that was at that same party, you might get 10 different recollections of it. Everybody's vantage point and everybody's view. So, you know, basically, like I said, it depends on who you talk to. That's how you figure out whether uh, their interpretation is, is true or their interpretation is false. Got you, got you. So, well, I believe that your history is intact and uh, it speaks for itself. I mean, you you know, you, you are a legendary turntablist, legendary DJ, pioneer, an icon, studio owner, sound system creator, even an executive with your own record label, right? And everything that you did with Bambada. I did just about everything in the music business from the root of the tutor. You know what I'm saying? Right. Everything in here. And, I'm, and, you know, I, 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 I'm not just... A hip hop DJ. I'm I'm a I'm I'm what's called a all around DJ because I love I love uh play I, I play I play a whole night of country western music if I'm in the mood. Uh you know, I play 
I played for 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 Moyle, Brisk. I've done Italian weddings. I've done Jewish <laughs> Jewish weddings, and these people are like, oh, 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 he knows about that. I've played African weddings. I've, I, you know, it's like I don't never want to as a DJ. I don't think you should ever be put in a box where you got it. You got to uh, you, uh, you get cat. That's why I hate to be categorized. Oh, you hip hop DJ? No, I'm not. I'm every DJ. Well, well, back in the day when, when when you all started, I mean, that's what you did. You played everything, right? You you played everything possible, all genres of music, correct? There you go. We we might have uh, uh, specialized in hip hop because that's what we actually had a, a we had a whole hand in starting the whole culture of hip hop. But at our jam, you remember we started back in the days when there wasn't a whole plethora of hip hop music. We had to create the music. Right. So, hip hop, hip hop to me was the bastard child of soul, funk, rhythm and blues, rock and roll, jazz. You know, even Caribbean, even some uh, 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 European music. All of that combined created hip hop, and now hip hop is recreating a lot of that other music. So, more or less, it's like to, to, to just any 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 DJ that's a good hip hop DJ could play all around the spectrum. They could play club music. They could play EDM. A lot of the hip-hop DJs are playing those type of formats of music. You know what I'm saying? A lot of people we inspired went on to be Little Louis Vega, started out between playing club music, but then got into hip-hop and then went back into house and all of that. You know, so a lot of these cats are playing that. You go you go to Kenny Dope. You know, you go to a, a, a lot of these cats that are, you know, say, uh, DJ Spinner. You know, these are uh, uh, just, you know, a few names that, you know, they, they're not in a, in a bubble. And more or less, that's the way I consider myself. I'm not in that bubble where I'm only hip hop. Hip hop hip hop is my first love that introduced me to the music. But the music was introduced to me before hip hop was even born. Right. You're a, you, you are a bona fide DJ, period. <laughs> There it is, baby. <laughs> so, look, before we get out of here, and I want to thank you for your time. Before we get out of here, give me one Jazzy J experience or story from your history. Well, besides that, like that, that, that defining moment, I told you that I'm, I, I, I was so excited that night with the, the battle of the peak connection. There's one, there's one story I tell a lot of people that, that always stuck in my mind is that, you know, a lot of cats don't realize that we broke ground. When, when when people didn't even know what we were doing. You know what I'm saying? Like you go, you go, you, we, we, used to, we used to do what's called the Chitlin Circuit. Now, if you know what the Chitlin Circuit is, that's when all the black artists used to be let in the back door, they used to play in, in places. And then and then when you played in the in the country places, you know, Baton Rouge, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, or uh, whatever, it's this place that we played, I, I call it, Collard Greens, Mississippi, because I can't remember exactly what the name of the town we played in, but you know they were used to seeing cameo and uh you know uh, and brass construction and all of this. So they see us coming up in there. We early early uh 1980s one doing Planet Rock, and they like yeah they hear this song it's different it's big you know and you know you go into some of these places and you know they never really seen it before so we go up into this little place collard greens mississippi roll up with the tour bus and everybody's like yeah 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 you know what I'm saying little back dirt roads you got a little shack in the back we felt like the damn five heartbeats get up in there they got a little crappy system with with with, with maybe two microphones that that the guys have to share so we start patching equipment in and then realize that this is one of them one of them slicker country promoters who had done after everybody got in he packed up all of the box office money and split stole all the <laughs> right? money yeah yeah dude split so the road manager comes back and he's like yo listen let me tell you because we already you know part of our contract is you know like everything we already got half the money up front before we got there my man must have felt yeah nah this ain't a big enough pot for me to pay them the other half let me just grab this and, go, and be ghost so he took the money and left. Road manager comes back to us. Uh, we already got half the equipment set up on the stage. Like, all right, what do you guys want to do? Uh, at this point, we can just get the hell out of here because we don't get paid. We don't play. But 
where we come from, rather promoters shits on, on on everybody. We're there. The people didn't come to see the promoter; they came to see us. So we like we're gonna give them a show anyway. I, right, you know what? We just do everything from the turntables, pack up the keyboards, pack up the drum machines, pack up all all, all the sound effects, all of that. You know what? We do our regular routines the way we did them back in, in, in the stage in Bronx River. So as we're setting up, you know, you get one of them cats in the crowd. Oh, man, what the hell? Where, 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 where the drums at? Where the guitars? Where, where, where? So we like, oh, shit, this is one of those, man. They ain't never, they ain't never really seen no, you know, no, no, and two turntables and a microphone MC style. Right. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, wow, this is pre-run DMC. We, everybody, I think the only person that was out on the road besides us was probably like Flash and the Furious Five, uh, you know, probably went through some of these stories. So we just packed it up. So we get on the thing and we put the, we start everything off. But I, I usually started out with Monterey Groove, Pieces of a Dream, and I, I bring the MCs out. I, so I'm on, I'm on, I'm cutting up Monterey every Groove. So they're looking and they don't quite understand what's going on, but they're like, huh, wait a minute. I guess I guess we could deal with that. Of course, you still got the haggler in the crowd. I know y'all ain't fitting to play no records. He didn't say, I know y'all ain't going to play no records. He said, I know y'all ain't fitting to play no records. <laughs> right, right. I said, okay. And the sound system sounded like shit. We got mics is buzzing all over the place. I know y'all ain't fitting to play no records. I go home if I want to listen to some records. Oh, no. So he's getting the crowd all riled up. So I was really like, all right, fuck it. Let's just jump into Planet Rock and get the hell on out of here because we're doing this shit off of Humble. We ain't even getting paid for this. So by the time, party people, party people, can y'all get funky? And they say, yeah, just hit me. Boom, they start throwing shit up on the stage. <laughs> <You> know, <laughs> that, that father say, yeah, just hit me. Somebody hit him upside the head with, with some food. And they started throwing stuff on the stage. We're like, oh, shit. So they, of course, they threw something, hit the turntable, knocked the needle off. I go jump in the crowd and jumped on the motherfucker. That they hit me big, grabbed me, pulled me back up, off, off, off the two, right? We get back on the stage. They still trying to throw shit at us. And this, that. So I grabbed one turntable. Uh, Power, I grabbed the mixer. Big grabbed the other turntable. We jet out. We got, we slide everything back up on the bus. The road manager's trying to unplug wires and get everything off, and we get back up on the bus. Man, they rocking the bus. They banging on the side of the bus. They throwing stuff at the bus. Wow. We're like, ah. So then we like, now we got to escape. We finally get back on the bus. But now we got to escape. We trying to get out. Somebody parked. A, it's only one road in and out, a dirt road at that with ditches on both sides, right? Dude, dude parked the Trans Am right in the middle of the road. And it's like only enough room for like one car to get by. But it's a big ass tour bus. The bus driver, you know, the bus driver's white. He's nervous. He's like, oh shit, we're going to get lynched out here. It's like, yo, no, nah, that's white people lynching black people. Black people don't do that. They're just, they, they just going to beat your ass real good. <laughs> so <laughs> so he did, we get out and he's like, he's like, what should I do? What should I do? And Biggs was like, fuck that. Put that shit in the ditch. Sure enough, he drives through, boom, hits the Trans Am. Knocks the motherfucker in the ditch. Now we got a fucking convoy of Cadillacs and 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 Impalas and all kinds of cars chasing the bus. They chasing us down the highway. We had to yo, dude. The state troopers came. Good thing they came. State troopers came. We explained to them the situation. State troopers had to escort us all, and these cars followed us all the way back to the hotel. We had to collect our shit, throw it up on the bus. No, no, there ain't no packing. Grab your shit up in balls and throw it back on the bus. And the state troopers were like, yo, well, we're only going as far as the county line. After the county line, y'all on your own. They're like, oh, shit. We were like, well, we're going to have enough gas. And they followed us from the hotel, followed the state troopers all the way to the country, all the way to the county line. We got past the county line, and I guess they must have gave up and turned around and went back, and that shit was so funny. I was like, "Yo, man, we 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 laughed about it later on, and we was cracking up." But when that shit was going down, we was like, "Wow, this is what it was like back in the days in the Chitlin Circuit." Wow, and it's it's crazy because then, like, it wasn't even like months later, 
Oh, years later, like months later, then next thing you know, it's like Run DMC comes out and they're making noise and this and that. And now people are accepting this like wholeheartedly, two turntables and the guys and, 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 and with no sneakers, no laces in their sneakers. So that's not, and we're like, wow, this not too long ago, we got chased out of fucking town for doing exactly what we started with their following us doing. You know, wow. it's crazy. It's crazy, but that's like a little story. Is like, it's so funny that, you know what I'm saying, how, you, how times have changed. Now it's, it's totally accepted. You see R&B artists get up there with a DJ. We had to break ground in, a, in, in uncharted waters where people didn't even understand that. It's like that, that the cycle, the cycle has changed so much. And I had to like share that with you. Like, you know, wow. a lot of these cats, a lot of these cats are doing it today and they, they don't really realize what the hardships they had to go through in order to spark this wave to get it happening. And that's what we had to do. We had to live through that. Wow. Well, that sounds, uh, I mean, that sounds crazy. I mean, it sounds like a scene from a movie. So definitely an experience. I appreciate you sharing it. How can our listeners continue following the original Jazzy J? Original Jazzy J, Jazzy J Production, Facebook, Twitter, uh, Instagram. You know what I'm saying? Holla at your boy, join up, and check me out. You'll see what I'm doing. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Right now, you're listening to Vinyl Westwire, the DJ podcast that uplifts the DJ culture and honors our legends. And I had the privilege to talk to the original DJ Jazzy J. And you know this, man. Hello, Joe. I want to welcome you to Vinyl Esquire, the podcast 